welcome to uh, the dialogue once again and and thank you for being there at the inaugural um, uh, let me invite the foreign secretary who's the host of this dinner uh, to say a few words and to get the evening going so can i request you to to say a few words to us mr gokhale excellencies ladies and gentlemen welcome to the fifth edition of the raisina dialogue in a very short span of 5 years This annual event has grown in stature thanks to the enthusiastic participation we get from countries around the world not only from those in government but those in business industry from representatives of the militaries as well as from the media The Raisina dialogue is of course located in the Indo-Pacific region but we are hosting global conversations you saw the panel that was there uh, at the inaugural session and i'm very happy to say that this year we are close to 100 countries the platform is large enough to accommodate different perspectives and all shades of opinion it is not judgmental and it is not prescriptive raisina follows a principle dear to mahatma gandhi the apostle of peace and non-violence whose 150th birth anniversary we are celebrating this year and i want to uh, read a quotation from gandhi I quote I do not want my house to be walled in on all sides and my windows to be stuffed I want the culture of all lands to be blown about my house as freely as possible but I refuse to be blown off my feet by any and I think this very much symbolizes the spirit of Raisina We have keynote speeches by many foreign ministers and other dignitaries panel discussions with noted experts from different geographies and disciplines and while the burning questions of the day will undoubtedly be debated raisina is about future trends in climate in disaster management in digital technology in healthcare for the planet and on matters relating to the cyber world and therefore there is something for everyone and i hope all of you enjoy the next two days the opening night's dinner is also traditionally an occasion to hear perspectives from three eminent people from around the world and i am delighted this year Uh, to introduce uh, and also welcome Mr Neil Zanan the state minister of the federal foreign office of germany um, he is an old friend when i was in germany he used to be the spokesman of the social democratic party on foreign affairs and therefore rightfully is the uh, state minister uh, in the new government um, mr julian ventura the uh, deputy secretary of foreign affairs of mexico uh, who i also know because we served together in beijing and commodore melinda ross uh, of the new zealand navy who has broken the glass ceiling by rising to the highest echelons of the navy in new zealand therefore without further ado i invite samir saran to open the proceedings for this evening and ladies and gentlemen i hope you enjoy your dinner as well thank you thank you sir so um, as we um, I have I have heard from the foreign secretary we will have three speakers and it's my pleasure to invite the first speaker for this evening Neil Zanan the state secretary from Germany he is also an alumni of the Busiris Summer School which is the partner organization of the ORF and together we have 1600 alumni many of them are ministers because of this school i can take credit for that so uh, please join us Neil and we look forward to hearing from you good good evening excellencies ladies and gentlemen Uh, dear friends, uh, Mr. Foreign Secretary, thank you very much uh, for also your kind words. I want to say it's really a pleasure to be here, uh, to follow the invitation, and um, Vijay, it's um, it's always good seeing you because you served with distinction as the ambassador of India in Germany, and you remain a friend of our country, uh, and that is maybe the most important part: having friends and. in troubled times so thank you very much ladies and gentlemen as we usher into a new decade the 2020s one thing has become crystal clear once again peace cannot be taken for granted the developments in the middle east in ukraine and asia remind us of the power politics of the 19th century nationalism isolationism militarization have somehow gained momentum and the existing international order that very order that after the second world war has brought peace and prosperity at a level not seen before 
in the history of mankind is under attack. Unfortunately, we seem to be thrown asunder just when the need for international cooperation in a connected world appears essentially urgent, be it on peace, be it on the environment, in mastering the digital, digital sphere or global finances, or in safeguarding international trade as a source of prosperity for us all. Ladies and gentlemen, if we seek to defend the basic pillars of the liberal order, we have to accept one simple truth. Our common task will be to find balancing elements and make sure that everyone, even the most assertive global powers, continues to operate in a rules-based multipolar system. I believe that Europe and the Indo-Pacific region can play their part. Geographically speaking, we seem far away from each other. That's true. However, when it comes to social, political, or economic developments in our interconnected reality, this geographical distance is no longer as relevant as in the past. So although we are very obviously not a part of this region, Germany and Europe as a whole have strong stakes in it. As a continent, Asia is EU's largest trading partner. The Indian and Pacific Ocean are traversed by the world's most important shipping routes, including essential bottlenecks such as the Strait of Hormuz and Malacca. And any threat to these vital lifelines, any conflict, in the region will have a direct impact on the functioning of our economies and therefore, ladies and gentlemen, on Europe's prosperity and security too. Given this significance to the Indo-Pacific as a main route for commerce and energy flows between continents, it is in Europe's interest to ensure that maritime routes and the lines of communication work uninterrupted. It is in Europe's interest to ensure that economic competition is framed by rules-based order, the functioning of the WTO is vital here. And it is in Europe's interest to ensure that militarism does not escalate into conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, the decline of US centrality as a provider for security in Asia and the stunning economic success of many Asian countries has favored China's increasingly assertive foreign and security policy, especially in its own neighborhood. Rising uncertainty and threat perceptions have made the region less stable, as indicated by military expenditure. Such risks to international security and global trade are compounded by transnational issues, such, such as violent extremism and terrorism, as well as the impact of climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, the situation requires a two-track approach from Germany and Europe on the one hand. We need to do what we can to help the Indo-Pacific region finding a new balance and prevent a power monopoly. But how do we do that? I believe by working with like-minded partners such as India, further diversifying our partnerships in the region investing in connectivity and helping to rebuild resilient capa uh, capacities also in smaller countries. And on the other hand, we need to promote multilateral approaches in the region and worldwide. And again, how do we do that? I believe again by working with like-minded partners, reinstating passion for and believing in multilateralism and inviting everybody to join us. This is why Germany and France, supported by India, established the Alliance for Multilateralism, an informal and inflexible format with which we want to advance pragmatic yet, yet principled cooperation to find solutions on issues ranging from international humanitarian law to disarmament, to new technologies, to name just a few. So friends, ladies and gentlemen, I believe Europe and the Indo-Pacific also share one major concern, namely the fear of being affected by and caught up in great power antagonisms. Unilateral hegemony in the Indo-Pacific or bipolar international order neither lies in our interest, 
knowing that of the region, because it would curtail the region's potential and the autonomy of local actors. And it should be clear that watching from the sidelines is not enough. Ladies and gentlemen, my message to you today is this. Germany is a stakeholder in the Indo-Pacific. We are partners and we are friends. And at the end of the day, that's why I'm here. But we have not yet exhausted our full potential. And I see three areas of convergence that are crucial for European engagement in the region. First, infrastructure and technology. Second, security. And third, strengthening the regional multilateral forums. So investments in infrastructure and in technology in the region are essential. And that is why the EU, the EU has adopted a connectivity strategy for Asia, focusing on transparency, fiscal and environmental sustainability, and a level playing field. This connectivity strategy addresses the cross-border cooperation in areas of transport, energy, technology, and economic integration, those increasing available options and facilitating diversification. That is why Chancellor Merkel and Prime Minister Modi at the most recent intergovernmental consultations here in New Delhi gave the green light for cooperation in the field of artificial intelligence and why Germany is working with India on green urban mobility in a program totaling 1 billion euros. Ultimately, leadership on frontier technologies and economic growth will be decisive factors in determining a new balance of power. In return, we also expect from our Asian partners to make their economies fit for international trade and investment and also to strengthen liberal democracy. Second, we need to talk about security. There will be no balance of power without hard security. This is a field in which Europe must take greater efforts to understand the strategic needs of the region and, in return, in which the region must work harder to understand the potentials, but also the limits of what EU and its member states can realistically contribute. European countries already bear a substantial part of the burden with respect to supporting Afghanistan. For instance, where the situation is still far from good, but where at least the threat to the region and the world has been kept in check since 2001. Afghanistan, ladies and gentlemen, isn't the only example of Germany's and Europe's engagement in the region. Of course, the EU's Operation Atalanta is tackling piracy around the Horn of Africa. Germany is part of the global coalition against Daesh and plays a vital role in stabilizing Iraq. Together with our European partners, we are trying to save the JCPOA, balancing pressure on Iran with continued dialogue. And Germany is involved in efforts to restart the peace process in Yemen. Following a broad geographic and comprehensive conceptual approach, Germany has helped to foster democratic structures in a number of Asian countries, including Pakistan, and I'm happy to say also the Maldives, Mr. Foreign Minister, Sri Lanka, and other countries. Of course, there is always more that we can do, especially when it comes to capacity building in this region. As India, the largest country in South Asia, increases its interoperability with the armed forces of the United States, it will also become easier to coordinate with other NATO countries, such as Germany, be it for military exercises, for training and assistance to third parties, and potentially also for joint operations. And let me come to the third point. The balance of power is only one aspect of Germany's and Europe's approach to the Indo-Pacific. Another necessary component is strengthening the multilateral regional architecture and its capacity to resolve regional conflicts in a peaceful way. Without this element, the evolving Indo-Pacific idea, whether concrete from it may take, will fall short of its vision. Here, European experiences come to my mind. We had such multipolar orders in Europe prior to the First World War, and to a certain degree, also prior to the Second World War. Volatility, unpredictability, 
lack of transparency, mutual suspicion and arms races, those were the main features of those multipolar orders. In the end, this multipolarity led to various ports and to devastating confrontations. The lesson Europe drew from these experiences is that any multipolar order only works with a high level of inclusiveness and has to be combined with a binding set of rules and multilateral or even transnational institutions. Cooperative security arrangement, including arms control and confidence building, multilateral trade and investment agreements, and a network of regional codes of conduct are needed in order to ensure a stable and a transparent environment. So let me close, ladies and gentlemen. Despite the numerous multilateral organizations and its informal formats here in the region, I think we'd all agree that an actual multilateral architecture in the region has not yet been achieved. That is why we are supporting and sharing experiences with organizations in the region and why the EU has launched a project on security cooperation in and with Asia starting this year. Ladies and gentlemen, above all, we need to imbue multilateral cooperation with new life, especially in Asia. If we fail, international organization could rapidly become marginalized and our international problem solving capacity could be further diminished. If we live up also to this task, we have every reason to be hopeful about finding joint solution to the shared problems. I thank you all very much for listening and I thank the organizers for the invitation and I wish you uh, a good evening. A pleasure to invite the second speaker this evening, Commodore Melissa Ross, Deputy Chief of the Royal New Zealand Navy. Uh, and she's going to be speaking on the theme Common Global Challenges, Local Solutions. Inga mana, inga reo, inga iwi. E rau rangatirama, tina koutou, tina koutou, tina tatou katoa. Kia ora and namaste. <laughs> I greet you in te reo, the language of the Māori people of New Zealand, Aotearoa. Greetings to you all. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today at Rizina Dialogue. I want to acknowledge the, uh, to Mr. Foreign Secretary and the Observer Research Foundation for the organization. I want to focus my remarks this evening on the common challenges we face in the Indo-Pacific. In particular, I want to share New Zealand's recent initiative to lift the level of our investment and kotahitanga, or togetherness, in the Pacific region. New Zealand is a liberal democracy located in the far south of the South Pacific. We see ourselves as part of the broad Indo-Pacific region, but within that, we are a Pacific country. We are connected by culture, by history, and by shared interests with other Pacific Islander nations. We see ourselves as both in and of the Pacific. We are also a small country when compared to the global powers whose impact and voice is far greater than our own. And this colors how we see the world. We all want a safe, secure, and prosperous Indo-Pacific region from the North Pacific to the South Pacific. This is our common vision, but there are challenges to this vision. Across geography and domains, challenges once regarded as future trends are fast becoming present and persistent realities. Strategic competition and territorial disputes threaten to compromise our respective national interests. We are particularly seeing this play out in areas where our national interests converge, such as busy maritime routes. In New Zealand's immediate neighbourhood, we are also seeing complex disruptors of a scope and magnitude previously not seen. 
These include cyber attacks that compromise our financial, communications and political integrity, transnational organised crime and terrorism that threatens our social fabric. A critical complex disruptor, the impact of which we already see and has been discussed tonight already, is climate change. And I want to draw attention to this particular, particular challenge for my area. For New Zealand and the Pacific, climate change is not simply a feature of the strategic environment. It will have far-reaching implications across many aspects of our society. Climate change will exacerbate water shortages, food insecurity, loss of livelihood, and impact public health. Further challenging areas around the world with limited resources or weakened governance. When not well managed, these social impacts of climate change have the potential to heighten security concerns in the Pacific and extending into both maritime, Indo-Pacific and further afield. From the New Zealand defence perspective, climate change will be a driver of operations with greater demand for responses in the wake of devastating severe weather events. It's important to acknowledge that the varied manifestations are affecting communities in my region today and we see long-term security implications. More than ever, the New Zealand Defence Force will be required to play a role in efforts to curb the impacts of climate change. In responding to this security challenge and others, New Zealand Defence is committed to working closely with like-minded partners who have the resources, capabilities and convening power to significantly enhance Pacific security. And we are, are, looking, uh, are working to lift our engagement and invest in Pacific regional security architecture. I've spoken about some of the common challenges that we are facing in both the Indo-Pacific and the Pacific region. I want to address how New Zealand is responding to some of these challenges in partnership with our Pacific neighbours. The New Zealand government's Pacific Reset announced in March 2018 is a whole of government effort to lift our investment and in kotahitanga togetherness as part of the Pacific community and changes our mindset to address the increasing complex issues in our region. The reset has been a significant shift in what New Zealand does in the region and how we engage. Our emphasis has been on encouraging engagement in the region that aligns with and supports Pacific priorities and values and contributes to the security, prosperity and sovereignty of the region and its people. We are moving away from the donor-recipient dynamics of the past and building deeper and more mature partnerships. This not only enables frank conversations about shared policy, priorities and challenges, but we see our refreshed approach to the Pacific as a contribution to the international rules-based order. It is just as important to promote and safeguard laws and norms, including transparency in the Pacific as it is further afield. As a small country, our stake in the international rules-based order is fundamental and concrete. Firstly, it is the foundation of our security, and it has broadly led to the peaceful coexistence and cooperation of states, large and small. Second, it has given us and other small nations such as ours an equal seat at the table. The order enables us to pursue prosperity and independent foreign policy. Third, the laws, norms and institutions of a healthy order preserve stability and safeguard against conflict and uncertainty. So how are we engaging? Partnership and strong people-to-people -people ties have long been a hallmark of the New Zealand defence approach in the Pacific. In October last year, New Zealand Defence released the Advancing Pacific Partnerships Defence Assessment. This assessment puts forward a vision of an intergenerational investment in a secure, stable and resilient Pacific 
achieved by advancing our partnerships in supporting existing regional security architectures. Some of the key elements of this partnership include planning and acting together, using inclusive participatory dialogue and understanding Pacific stories, thinking broadly about an expanded concept of security and the broader community, and building resilience together. Many of the challenges we face today are global. However, we require innovative and new locally devised solutions to combat these issues. Some of the ways we have done this is through implementing new initiatives. For example, small initiatives. We recently developed the Pacific Leader Development Programme. This is developed by the New Zealand Defence Force in partnership with our security sector counterparts in Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Tonga and Vanuatu and with the support of our Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. The long-term goal of the Pacific Leader Development Programme is to work with each partner country to build leadership capacity and to potentially and eventually expand the programme into other Pacific Island countries. It will assist our partners in developing and implementing their own leadership frameworks across their security sector and other government agencies. The program will also build cooperation across the Pacific through a network of leaders to support regional security issues. New Zealand Defence also is working to contribute to democracy and good governance. We've been working with Fiji to, on the review of their military justice system. This is a Fiji-led initiative which supports their vision of good governance structures within the Republic of the Fiji military forces. New Zealand Defence also supported the Solomon Islands by providing a package of support for their national general election in, in April 2019. We also provided logistical support to the New Zealand-led unarmed police support mission which assisted with the Bougainville referendum. This contributed to advancing democracy and the democratic participation of both the Solomon Islands and the Bougainvillea peoples. Lastly, how can we achieve a truly democratic society when half of the population is underrepresented in the rules-based system we rely on? The Women, Peace and Security Agenda is critical to positive peace and security outcomes. New Zealand strongly believes that this work is most effectively progressed together through a collaborative and multilateral approach. Last August, New Zealand co-hosted with Samoa a Women, Peace and Security Summit in Apia. This promoted the visibility and implementation of the global women, peace and security agenda in the Pacific and encouraged women's participation at all levels of the peace and security governance in the Pacific. The summit encouraged the discussion and highlighted the importance of meaningful participation of women in the security sector through leadership positions, including in the military context. It supported the Pacific region's efforts for gender equality, and this also underscored the fact that regardless of geographic location, gender diversity leads to better outcomes and solutions for communities during times of peace building and conflict situations. To further strengthen these efforts, the New Zealand Defence Force launched the Pacific Defence Gender Network to propose to promote gender equality across those, military, those militaries and provide an avenue for Pacific militaries to engage and share learnings of their own on this important topic. So what are the New Zealand Defence Force observations that I can offer to this group today? This is neatly summed up in the word I've used already, kotahitanga, togetherness. This is a collective action in my culture, the Māori culture. What I've discussed today are some common global challenges and how we're addressing them in our neighbourhood and in our way. New Zealand looks to address these challenges by building valued, sustainable partnerships across our 
Pacific nations. The Pacific Reset defines and shapes how we engage with the Pacific region, the Indo-Pacific, and the wider world. It's a significant shift in how we engage in the region, as well as what we do. And people are at the center of what we do. We see our refreshed Pacific Reset and partnership approach to the Pacific as a contribution to the international rules-based order. And we look forward to continuing to work in partnership with Indo-Pacific countries to amplify the Pacific voices around the world. Kia ora tato. thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, the last uh, keynote this evening. And I would request you all to settle down. So it's my pleasure and privilege to invite the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs Mexico, Julian Ventura, to uh, speak to us. He's going to be speaking on old lessons for a new era, the value of collective action, a view from Latin America. Thank you, uh, Samir, for saving the best for last. Uh, it's always a challenge to come in at the end of, uh, of a dinner, so I will uh, speak entirely in Spanish to make you sure that you stay glued to your seats for the rest of the evening. No, seriously, I'm, I'm, I'm very honored to be the first Mexican uh, senior official who joins and participates in this uh, Ricina dialogue. It's an indicator of our very strong and close uh, partnership. So thank you, o ORF, thank you, Samir, and thank you, my friend and colleague, uh, Vijay Gokale, for this kind invitation. As he mentioned at the beginning of the dinner and in the interest of uh, full disclosure, as ambassador to China, I had the pleasure of serving with both uh, Foreign Minister Jai Shankar and Foreign Secretary Gokale uh, during their respective tenures as heads of mission in Beijing. And there I was able to witness their tremendous skill in managing such a complex and globally relevant strategic relationship. I can only say that India is lucky in this time to have uh, had in them uh, two uh, ex outstanding diplomats in the two top leadership positions, especially at this global juncture. It's also, I think, particularly pertinent to share the stage with uh, Neil Sandin, my German colleague, and of course with Commander Ross. You have three examples of global players who give a lot of emphasis in their international diplomacy to forge consensus and build uh, coalitions. Germany and Mexico have an ambitious strategic partnership, which we are working hard to deepen and widen. And Mexico and New Zealand work very closely on a wide range of issues, from countering the responsible, uh, the use of the internet to disseminate violent extremism, to promoting the responsible stewardship of our oceans. We are now also economic partners in the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, the CPTPP, and New Zealand, along with Australia, Canada, and Singapore, are in the process of becoming an associate member of the uh, Pacific Alliance, the very successful regional integration initiative led by Latin America's most dynamic and globally integrated open economies, Colombia, Chile, Mexico, and Peru. A few words about India and Mexico. As the first Latin, Amer Latin American country to have recognized India's independence, we have developed a close political relationship over the years marked by growing cooperation. We hold frequent consultations. This is my second visit to India in just over three months. And we have a long had a very positive working relationship in multilateral organizations. As of January 2021, we both expect to be non-permanent members of the UN Security Council. And we share a number of development-centered shared priorities in the G20 and other fora in a strong partnership that includes South Africa, and we're very glad to see the South African foreign minister, and in which the three countries are working very closely together to advance a socially relevant agenda in the G20 
framework. Our economic ties are strong and rapidly expanding. Trade with India and Mexico has uh, increased fourfold in less than a decade, and investment flows are growing in both directions. So it's a good indicator of how we overcome the tyranny of geography, some cultural contexts that are different, to really forge uh, globally relevant relationships in this, uh, in this time. As we focus here at Ricina on important geopolitical trends, regional flashpoints, and pressing global challenges, let me share with you a Latin American perspective from a country which is also an integral part of the North American market, the world's largest uh, regional economy, on the roots and nature of the challenges of global governance that we all, to a greater or lesser degree, face around the world today. And we have uh, here this evening uh, Prime Minister Stephen Harper, who uh, in his North American interaction always highlighted the importance of making sure that the social relevance and the social impact to global communities of the big trading frameworks, such as the one in the, in the North American context, was top of mind in the policy making decisions. Calls for economic, social, and political transformation are being heard around the world. Local conditions are very different, no doubt, as is the way in which society's discontent has or has not been channeled. Seemingly out of nowhere, this trend is now present in virtually every Latin American country in the form of political shifts resulting from electoral results, of mass street demonstration, demonstrations, or in some cases, both. It is important to keep in mind that what happens in Latin America is geopolitically relevant. 33 countries, including three G20 economies, over 650 million people, and a combined GDP that is similar to that of India and ASEAN put together. The key common drivers of these expressions of societal discontent are inequality and lack of, of inclusion. Our countries have made great progress in building democratic institutions with the expectation that a government by all would lead to tangible benefits for all. Most polls show that the current perception is that this has not happened. It is very difficult for any government to run effectively when questioned by the population at such a fundamental level. In Mexico, the elections held in July 2018 brought President uh, Lopez Obrador to power and gave his party strong legislative majorities in both chambers of Congress. His electoral platform called for a peaceful transformation of public life in which achieving social inclusion would be explicitly placed at the center of all government actions. As in every democracy, there is vigorous debate over policies and programs, but nevertheless, there is a broad political agreement in the sense that building a more cohesive and inclusive society should be the number one priority in the national agenda. Elected officials and public servants like myself that work in this administration are very much aware of the challenge of delivering on the existing high expectations. Elsewhere in the region, we have seen political social movements that result from comparable feelings of unease or discontent uh, with business as usual in this case. The list includes the election of President Bolsonaro in Brazil, as in the Mexican case with a strong democratic electoral mandate, the change of government in Peru, strikes in Colombia, the recent left to right electoral shift in Uruguay, mass demonstrations in Chile, one of the best performing and most inclusive economies in the region, and in Ecuador, and the events that led, of course, to the ouster of Evo Morales in Bolivia. Inequality and lack of inclusion are also critical elements that we are seeing elsewhere around the world. Think of your country or region. Think of calls for pension or fiscal reform or for electoral changes that lead to greater public participation. Think of difficult decisions over the use of natural resources. Think of the discussions over national and cultural identity. It is no deep insight to state that in today's world, no country can generate be better local conditions in isolation. We've known this for decades. We've also known that it is of existential importance to generate collective action on a, on a broad range of issues such as the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, 
the Global Compact on Migration, and of course the Paris Agreement. We've long recognized the role of multilateral diplomacy and coalition building. These are old lessons that must be revalued if we are to successfully nav to navigate this alpha century, which has brought us all uh, to New Delhi. Economic growth is dependent on exports and imports, on foreign investment, on global and national macro stability, and many other factors. In Mexico, we're very much aware of this fact. An incoming left of center government that many believed would be wary of free trade, not only supported CTPP, but completed the negotiation and ratification of an updated NAFTA, which has also just recently been overwhelmingly approved on a bipartisan basis by the US House of Representatives and is due for consideration by the US Senate. And we're also close, of course, to finalizing the ambitious modernization, modernization of our 2000 global agreement with the European Union, the first comprehensive trade and political agreement that the EU negotiated with a non-continental partner. These are all progressive agreements with clauses that we expect will help salaries increase along with productivity, bring growth to more regions and states, and elevate environmental standards. Together with Mexico's strong fiscal and political stability, these agreements provide certainty and enhance conditions for productive investment. Addressing climate change is a key imperative. The critical nature of this challenge has been made clear by the situation we are seeing in various corners of the world, including in my region, by the more frequent and severe droughts in Central America. The UNFCCC process remains key, as do other targeted actions on mitigation and adaptation. Mexico has launched a comprehensive development plan for our southern states and our northern Central American neighbors that seeks to not only mobilize additional resources, but also to unify the focus of international cooperation programs and maximize synergies among all stakeholders. We view this also in the context of our commitment to address all dimensions of international migration. We can find another very good example in the Sustainable Development Goals, which explicitly aim to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive um, uh, institutions at all levels. We should also do more, for example, against corruption, another growing societal touchstone that has uh, become uh, at the first level of attention both in developing and developed economies. And the 2021 special session of the UN General Assembly that will focus on this issue stands as a great opportunity to reaffirm our collective political will. What does this tell us about the challenges and pressure to reform the rules-based international order? If we accept that the core drivers of unease and discontent in our societies are inequality and lack of inclusion, and that value of collective action is an old lesson that needs to be learned again, are we moving on the right, in the right direction? Are we truly seeking greater collaboration? Are we explicitly and effectively focusing on the most pressing social needs? My working answer is unsatisfactory, as I'm sure you will find as well. Yes and no, there is unequal progress. The good news is that there have been recent noteworthy achievements. We are finding coincidences on important issues and can build upon them to provide deliverables to our societies. There are many states that want to work together on global challenges. In certain cases, when national governments have left a void, we have seen other stakeholders, NGOs, local authorities, philanthropists, step up and take on both traditional and non-traditional roles and even financing global initiatives. Many of us, are convinced that the rules-based order provides the most effective framework for collective action. There are initiatives in which Mexico is involved that are either showing good results or are highly promising, such as the high-level panel on a sustainable social economy and the Generation Equality Forum on Gender that we are leading and co-hosting co with France this year on the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Conference. At the regional level, an effort that has just gotten underway is our 2020 chairmanship of the community of Latin American and Caribbean states. The overarching theme that will guide us is innovation and development as approved by the region's foreign ministers meeting in Mexico City last week. MICTA is a cross-regional partnership created in 2013 by Mexico, Indonesia, the Republic of Korea, Turkey, and Australia 
In this framework, we have identified common concerns and joint positions. We have been sharing this informal space for almost a year, and next month we will pass along that responsibility to our Korean friends. What then are the bad news? Public discourse in favor of international law, predictable rules, and robust, robust institutions has most definitely declined. Key consensus that we all took as a given have become undeniably frayed. We are already seeing speaking, uh, specific consequences, such as the current state of the WTO appellate body. If this trend remains unchecked, we will be contributing to the problem that we are supposedly seeking to address. We will be ourselves fueling the popular belief that government by all, in this case, that the international rules-based system we share, does not lead to tangible benefits for all. We can learn from the Latin American experience about the effects that this can have. It is a political imperative for every government to defend and promote the national interest. It does not make for a catchy slogan, but the fact is that it is in everybody's national interest to build agreements, reach compromises, carry out long-term analyses, pay the necessary dues, and help carry the burden. It is in everyone's national interest to put forward a political discourse, both at home and abroad, that clearly links what we do together to what we achieve locally, and that focuses on equality, on inclusion, on cohesiveness, and on mutual respect. Let me close on that note by uh, sharing with you that these are old lessons, but we're not starting from scratch. We have institutions that can be strengthened, diplomatic processes that must be given new life, and coalitions that are moving forward or gaining momentum while making sure that others are able to catch up. Many of those playing important roles in this task are in New Delhi this week, thanks to the ORF and thanks to the government of India. You can count on Mexico as a partner in this endeavor. Thank you very much and enjoy your evening. <laughs>